and we're live good evening everybody and welcome to the first of our live events or here at ntu talking about all things application whether it's from your personal statement or talking to things about being what life is like here at ntu so today as you can see by the title is all about personal statements so here to debunk a few personal statement myths is kirsty if you want to introduce yourself Hi everybody, I'm Kirsty. I'm Head of Student and Alumni Relations at Nottingham Trent University, um, but throughout sort of my working career I've had about 15 years experience of supporting students to write and submit their personal statements. So if you have got any questions or comments or anything you want to know, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we will come to them as we progress through the session. Yeah, amazing. And I'll introduce myself. So my name's Katie. I work in the communications team here at NTU and I'm also a class of 2019 alumni of NTU. So I was in the exact same position that you guys were in six years ago, which is literally crazy to think. And yeah, as Kirsty said, if you have any comments, just pop them in the question box and we're happy to talk through them as we go through the um through the live. So before this, we actually popped up a few question box on our social media and asked for some questions from you guys that we can talk through during this live. So if you're ready, Kirsty, we can jump straight into the questions. Amazing. So if we pop the first question on the screen. So could you explain how the personal statement plays a role in the overall UCAS application? Yeah, of course, it's actually a really good starting point for um, this evening's session. So for the students who are watching who are already in the middle of submitting a UCAS application, you will hopefully know some of this already. But in case you haven't started your application just yet, you will probably be aware that you've got five choices to use on your UCAS application form. So you can apply to five courses at five different universities if you would like to. And that's quite common. So students will perhaps uh, choose history and they'll apply to do that at five different universities. Or you might find there's a university that offers a couple of courses that you quite like the sound of. So you might like the sound of history and then history and politics at the same university. And so you choose to use two courses, uh, two choices, sorry, for that one university. If you really want to, you can apply to five courses at the same university and um, probably wouldn't recommend that um, because you are putting all your eggs in one basket. But there's nothing stopping you if you wanted to. Some students will um, find that they're actually very interested in quite a niche course and it isn't widely offered across the country. So they might only find two or three that they want to apply for and they don't want to use all five of those choices. And if they don't want to, that's absolutely fine. And some people will be a little bit unsure what they want to apply for. So they might try and hedge their bets and perhaps apply to do, I don't know, um, engineering at Nottingham Trent, languages at Sheffield, nursing at De Montfort, um, engineering at Loughborough, and then something random like surfing studies down in Cornwall. Now, if you wanted to, you could do that. UCAS won't stop you. But the one thing that kind of underpins all of this is your personal statement. So this is a document which outlines to those universities why you're applying for that course. So if you spread yourself too thinly, it's going to be very difficult to show that commitment in your personal statement. So normally what we'd recommend is to use five very similar or five of the same courses for your choices on UCAS so that your personal statement remains focused. Uh, your application deadline um, is the 15th of, uh, sorry, the 26th of January. So you've got a little bit of time yet to be working on your application. Um, and the way the personal statement fits in the overall form. So first section, personal details. So that's where you give us your name, your date of birth, your address. Second section of the UCAS form is additional information about yourself. And we ask that wherever possible, you put as much information into that as you possibly can, because that then allows the university admissions departments to make really fair and accurate decisions about your application. So if we do have students who've perhaps faced additional barriers or challenges, or any kind of obstacle in their um, education journey so far, we can take that into account when they're making those applications and um, we make those offers. Section number three is where you list your university choices. Section four is your education history. Section five is your employment. So if you've ever had a part-time or full-time job, you put that in there. And then section six is your personal statement. So that's where it fits in the application as a whole. And then the final section is a reference, usually from your school or college, and that will really bring everything you've got in sections one to six together. And there'll be comments in there, usually from your teachers or your form tutor about you as a student. So it's quite a lengthy application overall, but the personal statement is normally the section that requires the most amount of time and attention. And it's where a lot of the students focus will be. Amazing. So it's really good that we're having a full live event on it today. Yeah. So for the next question, pop it on the screen. So why is the personal statement so important? 
Okay, so it's a really important document for us um, as an admissions team when we're looking through the applications. So you have to bear in mind that we get tens of thousands of applications every year from students, and the vast majority of them are from students who are very qualified, they've got the right kind of predicted grades that we need, and from the right kind of subject mixes. So we have to have another way of determining who we do and don't make offers to. And in a lot of cases, we're not in the position to do interviews um, and we don't often ask for examples of work unless it's a creative course that you're applying for. So we use your personal statement to sort of narrow down who we want to make an offer to. And that's why it's so important. It absolutely must reflect the best of you and why you're applying for that chosen course. So there are so many courses out there to choose from. We're talking tens of thousands. And if you can't demonstrate in your personal statement why you've picked that particular course area, it might concern some admissions tutors that you're not entirely sure what you want to do moving forward. And that could affect the success of your application. And as I said, it can be the only chance you get to really sell yourself to your university choices. So it's so important, your personal statement um, it reflects the best that you can do. It's well written. It's been proofread. And you've got all of the key information in there so that we can see, yeah, this is the kind of student that we want on our course at our university. Amazing. It's a bit like putting your putting your best self forward and, and representing yourself to the university. That's great. And um, so we'll pop the next question. So how should I structure my personal statement? It's a great question. Okay. So there's a few things that are um, key that everybody has to follow. So UCAS um, is quite a basic word processing package. So your personal statement must be in size 12 times new Roman font. That's the default setting by UCAS. You can't change it. And you can't have any sort of editing additional extras in your personal statement. So you can't use bold, underline, colour, italics or anything like that because the UCAS uh, site won't allow it, so to speak. So it will be typed like a normal Word document and the length is capped. So you only have 47 lines, which is just over a side of A4. So when I talk to students at the start of the application cycle, a lot of them are very worried that they won't have anything to write in their personal statement. And actually, the opposite tends to be true. They have too much to say and the difficulty is trying to get it to fit in 47 lines. So normally what I recommend you do is type your personal statement in a word processing package like Word, for example, play around with it, get it how you want it and then copy and paste it into UCAS. But if you can start all those draft versions in the right font, the right size, then you can kind of keep an eye on how long it is and you can make sure you're not writing too much information that you're then going to have to cut out. And then in terms of how you're going to structure it, we would recommend where possible you try and structure it through key paragraphs. So trying to keep your ideas neatly contained, giving examples where you need to and then moving on to the next point. And that will really help you manage the length of your personal statement, make sure you're not including too much waffle and that everything you're putting across is really clear and concise. And absolutely nobody can write the perfect personal statement in 20 minutes. It's something that is going to take quite a bit of time and effort. So you need to be prepared to do that. So like you said, you are putting your best foot forward and really representing yourself um, and all of your strengths. So I would say um, if you've not already, start by brainstorming ideas, everything you want to include in your personal statement and then try and pull those together into quite a rough draft. Don't worry if that's not perfect from the outside. Then you can obviously go through, you can change it around, move paragraphs up and down, cut bits out, add bits in until you've got something that you're really comfortable with. And then when you're confident it's the final piece, then copy and paste it into UCAS. Yeah, I definitely remember when I was doing mine that paragraphs really helped and splitting it out that way. And also, like you say, you end up, oh, I'm not really too sure where to start. And then as soon as you follow the paragraphs and the structure, it ends up being, oh, I've I've, I've written too much. So yeah, definitely don't be worried about having to having to cut some out because I remember I definitely did. Um, yeah. So the next question. So what sort of things should I write about in my opening paragraphs? OK, so I've kind of already touched on this already, but the most important thing is we get a real sense as to why you're applying for that course. And we don't mind what the reason is, but it is nice to see a reason there. So if we use the history example again, you might be applying to do history at university because it's always been your favourite subject at school. You opted to do it at GCSE. You're now opting to do it perhaps for an A level and you just want to continue with that learning. And that's absolutely fine. So you can include that in your opening paragraph. You might be choosing to do history because a couple of years ago you went on holiday to France. And as part of that, you visited some of the World War One memorial sites. You really sort of moved by that experience and you want to understand more about it. And that might be your reason. 
Or it might be something as simple as when you were a child, your grandparents went to London and you went to the Natural History Museum, you saw the big skeleton of the dinosaur and you've been obsessed with history ever since. So as I said, we don't really mind what the reason is, but we want to see it there. And bearing in mind, the person who's going to be reading your personal statement is somebody who teaches on that course. So although this might sound a bit sad, they live and breathe that subject. And what they're looking for is to, um, to admit students onto the course who have a similar mindset who are really passionate and enthusiastic about that subject, who are going to turn up to the lessons, who are going to participate, who are going to hand their work in on time. So if we don't get that passion and then that enthusiasm and that drive from your opening paragraphs, it can sort of concern us a little bit that perhaps this isn't the right course for you. So as long as you're demonstrating that to us, that's a perfect start to a personal statement. Yeah, that's amazing advice. I remember when I did mine, so I actually applied, I did fashion management at NTU. So that's a, a fashion side and a businessy call. So I wanted to kind of bring in both sides of that. So maybe an advice I would give is maybe think of your entirety of your course, maybe than just the actual um, course title, maybe thinking about the different things it would involve. And maybe there's two sides to the course that you could talk about. So yeah, that was definitely something I remember popping in mind. Um, and like you say, just saying why, you, why you're interested in the course. Yeah, and I think that advice works as well for anybody who's perhaps applying for a joint honours. So again, history yes. and politics, it's not the same course, but try and look for areas where there's commonality, where they link, where there might be topics in common that you can talk about as something you're particularly interested in. So that you're, you're sort of giving an acknowledgement or a nod to history and politics, but you're also picking out some of those common themes and threads that they have so that neither yes. subject kind of gets neglected, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Where they kind of why they kind of lap over and the and the main thing, main like you say similarities between them. Yeah. Um, so we've got the next question on the screen. And what would you suggest goes in the following paragraphs? So I guess I'm talking about the structure a bit here. Okay, so there's lots of different things you can cover, and there is no sort of hard and fast rule here. So you don't have to put these things in this order, but it might be how you want to start, and then afterwards you could obviously play around with it and move it around so you feel that the flow it, it reads correctly. But one thing I would definitely urge people to do is think about all of the transferable skills they've got that are going to make them a strong and successful student. Now, transferable skills is kind of a posh way of saying things like teamwork, communication, leadership, motivation. So when you're doing your brainstorm of what you want to include, why you want to do that subject, think as well about the skills that you've got as a student. Now, what I wouldn't advise you to then just do is list them in your personal statement because anyone can write a list. What you need is um, examples of where you get these skills from or how you put them into practice. And in a lot of cases, you can use what you're currently studying for at school or college to illustrate that to us. So if you are, for example, um, in the middle of doing either an A-level or a B-Tech in business studies, last week you might have had to do a group project where you've gone away and researched the career of Richard Branson and come back and presented that to the rest of your class. But that piece of work could be used as an example to show teamwork, research, communication skills, presentation skills. So just from that one example, you can demonstrate to us that you're not just claiming you've got these skills, but also that you know how to use them and how to implement them to be successful within your academic study. So you can also um, include skills that you might get from extracurricular activities, um, such as a part time job, if you've ever done any kind of volunteering work. Um, so if, for example, you have a part time job in a, a local supermarket, you can use that to show that you're organised, that you can manage your, your time, again, that you can work as part of the team. If you work on the checkout, that's a position of responsibility and trust. So even though your part time job might not be remotely related to what you want to apply for at university, the skills that you're getting still will be. Other things that you might want to include um, in your personal statement are things about um, work experience that you might have, wider reading that you might have done, field trips, etc. you might have been on. So if you're applying for a professional course, which is a course that leads directly into a profession, so something like nursing, teaching, midwifery, where there's a very sort of distinct job at the end of it, we do recommend wherever possible that you try and get relevant work experience. But we will be reasonable and we do understand that obviously COVID has had an impact on that and that hasn't necessarily been easy for people in the last sort of 18 months, two years. So this is a bit of an over-exaggerated example, but hopefully it illustrates what I'm trying to say. If you're applying to university to become a brain surgeon, nobody's going to have expected you to get work experience operating on people's brains at the weekends. Like that, obviously never going to happen. And we also know that actually getting work experience in a hospital is incredibly difficult to do. 
But what we'd be looking for instead is evidence that you've tried to work around those restrictions and where possible you've tried to understand a little bit about that particular industry or profession. So you might have been able to get a couple of weeks shadowing in your local GP surgery and they're probably not doing brain surgery there, but that is an NHS environment. You're learning about things like patient confidentiality, the importance of keeping accurate notes, how to talk to different patients to keep them calm and informed about their medical um, history or decisions. And that sort of stuff would be relevant in an application for any kind of health based course. The other thing you could include is wider reading. So what are you learning about around your subject that you're not being told you have to read for either your A-level or your B-Tech or whatever you might be studying for at the moment? So um, if you are doing English literature and your set, set text is something around World War I, have you read anything else about that subject or by the same author? How are you demonstrating that you're kind of going above and beyond? And it might not just be textbooks, you might be reading journals, you might be um, reading um, sort of news articles, try and stick over the tabloids, but anything that you're seeing in kind of broadsheet newspapers or on the BBC, that's that's absolutely fine. And again, stick over things like Wikipedia because they're not the most, most accurate sources of academic references. And then finally, you might want to talk about things um, that you've been to see or you've experienced. So if you were an art based student, you might have done this yourself, Katie. Have you been to see any fashion work? Have you been to any galleries? Have you been to any shows? And again, we know that that has been tricky um, in the last couple of years because of COVID. But a lot of things have been live streamed. So you might be able to say that you've not been able to go to a gallery, but you've you know, interacted with their digital offering and you've you've engaged with their activities online and that would show as that commitment to your course. So there's loads of different things that you can include in your personal statement and you can move them around. So you might have done work experience in your GP surgery and that is exactly now why you want to do nursing because you had that week, you shadowed a nurse for a couple of days and you're like, absolutely, this is the career for me. So actually your work experience might be in paragraph one where you're talking about why you've chosen that course or it might be a little bit further along in the personal statement, depending on how it flows best for you. So it's a really um, sort of fluid structure, whatever works for you. Everybody's personal statement should be different. It should be personal to them. But try and include those sorts of things is a really good idea. Yeah, definitely. I think kind of what you're saying about like the digital world, obviously, there's so there's so much to take advantage of with things going online recently. Um, I mean, I didn't do fashion before I came to university. So that's something that I'd kind of done um, alongside studies at college and things like that. And even if you're really interested in some sort of documentary that you've watched, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, just things you, you like you say that you read, it can be anything online. So really have a think and if there's anything like, yeah, like documentaries or online things that you've heard of or seen, I think that's a great thing to mention, especially because of obviously what's all been happening this past two years and how, how things have completely changed. Um, yeah. But yeah, I was just say one quick word of warning there. If you're going to say you've done something, make sure you've done it. So don't claim to have read a book if you've not picked it up or you've watched a documentary, because if if you do ever get called to an interview, they're probably going to ask you about it. If you've never seen that documentary at that point, you're going to be in trouble. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. Anything like that you've done, include it. Yeah, definitely don't want to get caught out on a, on a 500 page book or something like that. <laughs> definitely not a strong idea. Um, OK, so the next question. So we're moving on the same sort of structured question. So how would you conclude a personal statement? Um, OK, so I get asked this a lot. And to be honest, it's going to depend on how much space you've got left. So there are a few different ways you can finish it off. Um, so some people choose to finish their personal statement with a little bit of information about what they like to do outside the classroom. So talking about things like hobbies and wider interests. Um, that's absolutely fine. Not a problem at all. But don't dedicate too much of your personal statement to it. So I don't want 30 of your 47 lines explain to me what kind of season your football team is having, because obviously the balance isn't quite correct there. But you might want to say at the end of your personal statement that in your spare time, you are a real uh, fan of. Leicester City Football Club and you go and visit uh, you go and watch their games most weekends that would be absolutely fine if you can link any of your hobbies and interests back to any skills again that's fantastic so you might for example have grade eight piano and you want to use that to show that actually you're really determined and motivated to see things through to an end result um, so you can include those sorts of things in there if you're thinking about a gap year and you want to include that, that's not a problem, but try and outline roughly what your plans are. So hopefully you've got plans to perhaps go traveling and understand a little bit more about different cultures 
or work full time to get work experience or to save some money, that's absolutely fine. If you're thinking about a gap year, but you've got zero plans for at the moment, I probably wouldn't include it because it doesn't necessarily reflect well on you. Um, but you can, if you have them, put them in your personal statement. If you find that you're really running out of space, the stuff about kind of what you like to do in your spare time is nice if you can include it, but it isn't essential. So don't take out subject related content to put in about your football team, for example. And um, if you've run out of space, it is fine to kind of come to quite an abrupt end in your personal statement or finish off with a simple sentence along the lines of, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to studying history at university and to see where that might take me in my future career. Something like that would be absolutely fine because we don't want you to take out that core content to have a nice kind of conclusion. It isn't essential. It's not like an essay would be. Oh, well, Mason, sorry, I just jumped. To the right. <laughs> I didn't know if it had all frozen, but just a little jump on my end. Amazing. So and the next question, have you got any additional top tips I should think of? Um, I do have some um, and they are largely from my experiences over the last sort of 15 years. And they're mainly based on things that I would strongly recommend you don't do, um, because these are the kind of things that trip students up um, and don't necessarily reflect particularly well on them. So my first top tip is that there is no spelling and grammar check on UCAS. So please, please, please make sure that you um, accurately proofread your personal statement before you upload it into UCAS. Because if you send us a personal statement that's got spelling and grammar mistakes in it, it will come across that it's been quite rushed and you've perhaps not given it the care and attention it deserves. So we're not expecting really great literary pieces of work, but something that's full of spelling mistakes isn't going to reflect particularly well on you. Obviously, don't just rely on Word to pick out all of your mistakes because there are occasionally things that you can type in correctly that aren't spelling mistakes and Word won't flag them up. So I always recommend getting somebody else to read over it as well, just to make sure it's it's free of mistakes, but also that it flows properly. And there's nothing in there that actually jars or sits in a bit of a weird place. So getting a second pair of eyes to look at it, making sure it's free of mistakes and it does flow properly is a really good idea. Um, the other thing that I would, well, I would recommend you don't do, and I see this happen quite a lot, is people who repeat information that's already in their UCAS form. So they start their personal statement with something like, hi, my name's Katie, I'm applying for fashion and management, I'm doing these A-levels, this is what I've got in my GCSEs. And that's information we already know about you from the other sections in your UCAS form. So you're wasting that really valuable line space by telling us all that again. So try and steer clear of anything that's already in your form. Or if you want to pick up on something you've already mentioned, try and do it in a way that enhances that even further. So you might say, I'm doing A-level English and through this I've done X, Y, Z and it's given me these skills. That's fine. Um, but don't just list your A-levels again because we can already see them. Um, my biggest kind of top tip, and this is um, the one thing that I think is incredibly important and people might not be aware of, and that is that UCAS run every personal statement through something called similarity detection software. So under yes. no circumstances whatsoever should you borrow sentences from other personal statements, whether that's one you've seen on the Internet, that the school give you as a good example, or that your next door neighbour's second cousin twice removed sent in last year. Because what happens, it goes through the system. And if the system has seen a personal statement before, it'll get flagged as being copied. And that can be a real problem. Now, obviously, there are going to be common sentences so something like I'm really looking forward to going to university that come up every year. The computer will flag it and say, seen that sentence before, but an admissions tutor will say, OK, I can understand that. But if you've got a personal statement that is full of really common sentences, it's probably quite a weak statement in the first place. It's probably a bit too generic and not kind of um, unique to you. So really think about what you want to include in your personal statement. Again, how are you selling yourself? And that will knock out a load of those sort of accidentally plagiarised sentences. Yeah. And the easiest way to steer clear of it is just don't put any cliches in your personal statement. So the, the one that really, I don't know why, but it really drives me nuts in a personal statement is the kind of I have a dream speech. So students who start their personal statement with, you know, since I was three, I've dreamt of being a physicist. And you kind of think... No, you probably haven't. You know, most three year olds want to be firemen. They want to be um, astronauts um, ballerinas. They don't want to be physically. Yeah. So what's the real reason you've chosen that course? Why are you really going down that path? 
And that's what your personal statement should say. If you steer clear of the cliches, you're knocking out all of that kind of accidental plagiarism at the same time. A couple of other bits I'll quickly mention, then we'll take some of the questions. Um, you need to use really positive and enthusiastic language throughout, throughout to really sell yourself, but don't just swallow a dictionary. Make sure it's language that you're comfortable with and you understand the sort of true meaning of the word. Otherwise, you may find you run into some um, problems there. And again, that's why having somebody else read it and check it makes sense and reads properly will be really beneficial to you. And as I've already said, make sure you're giving examples throughout to highlight everything you're saying, whether that's skills that you've got um, or things that you um, are sort of saying about yourself to sell yourself to admissions tutors so they can see where that's coming from. And then my final top tip is just to make sure you have a suitable email address. So um, we do get a lot of applications from people whose email address was possibly submit the created, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Um, and they perhaps don't sound the most professional. And um, so even if you need to create an email address specifically for UCAS, do that. Make sure that we can see that you're taking this um, sort of seriously, that you're committed to this. And that that's an email address that you're going to be able to access for quite a while. If you apply with your school email address and then they cut off your access in the summer, that might be a problem um, when it gets sort of um, A level results day. So make sure you've got a personal email address that reads professionally and that you can get access to. Amazing. There's some really, really good top tips. I remember when I was applying for my personal statement when I was about six years younger than that, I used to spell my name K-A-T-I-I because I just thought it was, you know, I just wanted to make it cool. And that was my email address. And obviously that didn't match up with my application. So, yeah, that that didn't have to be changed. Yeah. I remember that. Um, one of the main things that you said and that I would just say is my top tip is as much as you might find it tempting, don't Google best personal statement for a fashion course or anything like that because just like Kirsty says it does get pulled up and it means that you're not it means that you're just not actually talking about yourself really and that it's it's an amazing opportunity to do so so yeah even if you, you might think oh it might be easy if I do that it's it's definitely definitely not worth it yeah. um amazing so we've on to a bit like a summary question which is nice so could you just summarize what we have covered so I don't miss anything I mean we've obviously covered so much in the last half an hour so I don't know if you want I don't know yeah, that's you fine. I mean just to sort of summarize there is no formula for writing a perfect personal statement every statement is going to be different that's absolutely fine but there are key things that would you know be a good idea to start with or that we would look to have included so Always start with why you've chosen that subject or that profession that you want to apply for. What is the real driving force behind that? Then move on to perhaps talk about your suitability, your transferable skills, what you're currently doing at school or college. That's all building up to that course. Talking then about perhaps longer term career objectives, part time jobs, wider reading, work experience, everything you've done. And um, again, has helped you come to that decision and has got you sort of prepared for it. And then finally, a little bit about the person behind the form. Um, I get asked quite often, you know, sort of how to weight your personal statement. I would say 30% of the space should go on paragraphs one, two and three, and then about 10% on the person behind the form. And as I've already said, if you're running out of space, cut that bit out first. It's nice if you can include it, but it isn't essential. Amazing. That is an amazing summary. Um, so basically, we're going to move on to some of the comments now. We can see that there's been loads and loads of comments coming through, which is absolutely amazing. Thank you all so much for popping them in there. If we don't come across um, your question in this call, then we will be going back to you um, personally through the comments and just saying where you'll be able to get more information from, just if we don't get onto that specific question um, this afternoon. So yeah, we'll just start pulling some of the comments together now. And... Amazing. So this is the first one from Lizzie. Thank you, Lizzie, for popping your question in. So how long does it take to hear back after sending the UCAS application? OK, it's a bit of a tricky one to answer uh, with a definitive um, sort of time scale, Lizzie. It's going to depend on the course that you've applied for and the universities that you've applied to. And also, don't forget, when you hit send on UCAS, it doesn't go to UCAS, it goes to your school. And then your school will check it, they'll add your reference, and then they will send it to UCAS. So just because you've hit send doesn't mean we've received it yet. And um, again, it's going to depend on what you've applied for. Um, in a lot of cases, you, you, you will usually hear something within sort of two to three weeks. Some courses will come back quicker, some might take a bit longer. Please do not panic. 
Um, again, if you can just think about this from the university's kind of point of view, we're sorting through tens of thousands of applications. So we will get to them as soon as we possibly can. But if you haven't heard back from university after 24 hours, it doesn't mean you're going to be rejected. It doesn't mean um, that your application has been unsuccessful. Uh, it's just that we're working through it as a process. And of course, when we receive your application, we're going to look at your um, qualifications. We're going to look at what you're currently studying. We're going to be looking at your personal statement and your reference. And we want to give each applicant um, due time and attention. We don't want to rush this process. We want to make sure everybody's application has been read and given the time that it deserves. So that can um, mean that application um, replies can be a little bit slower as well. But hopefully you will um, hear back within a few weeks. And then the absolute deadline for hearing back, providing you meet all of your deadlines, will be sort of towards the end of March. You'll have all of your offers and your decisions by then. Amazing. Oh, so we've got our next question in from Dylan. So will a personal statement really matter if you excel in the required grades? Um, yep, it absolutely does. Um, your personal statement can actually help you out at a couple of different points in the application process. So you have to bear in mind, as I've already said, we're getting lots and lots of applications. So just because you've got above the required grades or predicted to get above the required grades, it might also mean that everybody else you've applied have. So we can't just make a decision based on grades. We've got to be fair. Um, so we will use the personal statement again to help differentiate. If we've got too many applicants, this is what we're going to use to make a decision. It can also really help you out on results day. So if on results day you don't quite get the grades that you need and you perhaps miss by one or two, then again, we're going to go back and look at your personal statement and we're going to say, OK, Dylan applied, perhaps not quite got the grades we're asking for, but has got a really strong personal statement, very, very passionate about the course he's applying for. We still want to make him that offer. So I think it's an incredibly important document. And this is why I'm stressing to you, don't rush it. Make sure it reflects the best that it possibly can do from you. Definitely. I also think as well, a personal statement um, is a great thing to just have for for everything outside of mm -hmm. academia. So, for example, if you don't have a CV yet and you're wanting to put something like that together, a cover letters for, for jobs or part time jobs, sometimes they ask for that. And it's just a really great thing to spend some time on and find you know write all your skills down and really be able to pad it out and while you've got support there from your teachers at your school and things like that and all the resources are here I think it's a great thing to work on to then just have in your bank um, and you'll definitely you'll definitely help you at university at some point just just having it there so yeah it's, it is a, a great thing to work on um, I'm just going to see oh yes here's the next question so from Rebecca as a mature student looking at BSc geography what sort of information would you be looking to hear from me mostly why have I left it a few years work experience etc so I think this is kind of looking at like the mature um a mature student application personal statement yeah so it's completely up to you Rebecca as to what you'd like to tell us about you are under no obligation whatsoever to explain why you might have had a few years out of education that's None of our business, that's completely up to you. Some students do like to use that um, as a part of their reasoning for coming back into education. So they might say, for example, I left school at age 18, went and worked for three years, and actually that helped me understand that this was not what I wanted to do and that in order to get the career I wanted, I was going to need to go back to university. So some people will use it in that kind of respect, but you don't have to. Um, and if you don't want to, then the advice is exactly the same as what I've just covered. Talking about work experience, wider reading, your passion for geography, all of that would still apply to a mature student as it would do for a student who's sort of age 17, 18 applying as well. Um, so, yeah, whatever you'd like to talk about, as long as they're demonstrating to us why geography, that's the main thing. Yeah, definitely. Like you say, just popping your best foot forward and seeing how we get on. Um, so we'll see if we've got the next question now. I know there is loads coming in um, in the comments section. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, I just wanted to also confirm, sorry, what I said earlier about being able to reply to comments. Um, we actually won't be able to do that when the live's over. So if there is any questions that you still have after this time, feel free to send us a message on social media, on either the Trent, um, Nottingham Trent user Instagram, Trent Union Twitter, or the Facebook page, and we can get back to you them that, that way as well. Um, so amazing for the next question. When writing a personal statement, does the lines matter or does meeting the 4,000 characters matter more? Um, it's, it can alter a bit, can't it? With, yes, yeah. it's 
it's all about space and um, so um 47 lines is the max sometimes that can be four thousand it's about four thousand characters um so they're giving you the, the character count as a guide but if you go over 47 lines it will chop the bottom off your personal statement when you copy and paste it in and you'll get a kind of a i suppose a warning box or pop-up to say this doesn't fit or you know it, it's chopped the bottom off so you'll be made aware of that one thing I was going to say, and I forgot to mention, when you're structuring your personal statement, if you leave a blank line for the start of a new paragraph, like you would do in a report or an essay, that blank line counts off your 47 line total as well. So when it comes to copy and pasting it over, if you're struggling to get it to fit, then take those blank lines out to so save yourself a few extra lines. But if you can, just use the tab key to sort of indent the first line of each paragraph. So you've still got that definition there, but you're saving those blank lines. But yeah, 47 lines is the absolute maximum. It won't let like, you put any more in. Yeah, and you definitely don't want to write a bit more in, UCAS, uh, in, in your word and then copy it on and it crops out the last few yeah. um, statements or anything like that. So it's definitely worth just triple checking that it's on there. Um, so yeah, we'll see if the next question is ready. Amazing. So for the next question on our live, so do you have to talk specifically about the subject you're wanting to study in your personal statement, e.g. topic areas you're, you're interested in? This is going to depend on what your, your choices are as a whole. So if you are applying to do history, I don't know why I keep using history as an example, but it's <laughs> reason tonight, that's the one in my head. That's and you, yeah, and you are applying for history at all the choices you're applying to, then what you might want to do is look for um, topics or modules or themes that all five courses have got in common. So all of them might have a module on the Cold War, for example. So you could draw that out in your personal statement and say, I'm particularly interested in looking at the Cold War. If you are applying for those joint courses or you're applying for history and politics at one university and then history at the other four, obviously you're going to need to be a little bit careful there that you don't give any sort of bias towards the um, history and politics course. So again, what I, what I would normally say is because I'm a paper based person is get your prospectuses out and highlighter and highlight modules they've all got in common and, and, and draw on those. If you are one of the I'm going to hedge my bet students and you're applying for engineering at one university and nursing at another, this is where you're going to be in, pro in trouble because the two courses aren't similar enough. You won't be able to draw things through. So if your course choices do not have modules in common, then I would say either focus on future career plans or skills that they've got in, in common. So um, you might put something like, um, I believe that by completing this degree, this will help me enter a career as X. Or you might say, I believe that this degree will help me develop strong communication skills, which will then be of a benefit to me in the future. But this is where having quite a, a sort of focus on your subject choices will be a real benefit to you when writing your personal statement. Yeah, because you can imagine if it, like you say, if they're a bit too different it might be hard to find find the middle ground and like you say you might not be able to expand on certain things that you're interested no. in yeah not only really will you not have modules in common but the skill sets will be very different as well yeah. so if you have engineering and dance for example that's two very different set of skills as well as different modules and it would be incredibly difficult to yeah. write a statement for both of those I don't think there's an engineering and a dance museum that you can say you visited at one time. I think it might be quite, quite difficult. No. Amazing. So for the next question, is having a physical disability disadvan disadvantageous to students in the selection process? Absolutely not at all. And I cannot stress that to, en to people enough. What we're trying to do at all universities is ensure that we are offering places to students from all different walks of life and um, all different backgrounds. Um, we want we welcome that kind of diversity. But what we want to ensure is that when we're making offers for students, we're doing so um, with all of that in mind so that we can provide you with support and we can ensure that our offer is fair. And that if you have faced any additional barriers or challenges, um, that we are reflecting that in the offer that we make to you. So that's the kind of information that we would really like you to include in sections one and two of your UCAS application so that we're aware of that and we can factor it in. If you want any more information about this kind of um, decision making process, if you follow the URL that I think is scrolling on the bottom at the moment, <laughs> we'll um, give you the information for Nottingham Trent. But as I said, all universities are committed to the same sort of fair offer making practices. So absolutely, please include it in your application and do not have any concerns that it will be held against you because it absolutely won't.
No, definitely not. I always feel like uh, I'm on the news when the banner appears at the bottom and we're like, and, and reading off the <laughs> WW yeah. the bottom. I always hate to laugh. Um, okay, so, so one of the next questions. If you're mentioning transferable skills, including working in a supermarket, should you then mention the skills that come with this? Or will they understand that that's what I'm going to try to get at by mentioning it? So do they need to delve into the specific skills and then talk about everything that, you know, the job might entail? I would specifically mention the skills but you don't need to give us a load of context around how you get them so um i'm trying to think of a good example now for a supermarket but okay because a supermarket is going to involve customer service which is communication so if you say i have a part-time job in a supermarket which has allowed me to develop my customer service and communication skills we don't need you to then give us an example of where you've perhaps dealt with a difficult customer last weekend sort of thing but you have been very specific about the skills that you're drawing from it. If you're able to then relate them back to your course or chosen profession, that's even better. So if you were applying for uh, teaching, for example, you might say um, part time job in a supermarket, helping me develop communication skills. Communication is a key skill to be a successful teacher. So that's like the absolute personal statement goals, I suppose, with what you're writing about. But you don't need the sort of um developed example of oh so I was dealing with this difficult customer and she wanted this and we didn't have it kind of thing you don't need to include that kind of detail yeah just the overarching overarching skill lovely so we're down to the last few questions and it feels like I didn't realize there was just so much talk about personal statement I've just learned I've learned so much and I did mine so long ago um so yeah we'll move on to the last few questions so if you apply if you're applying to a different course in a different university will it be the same personal statement yeah. yeah, one personal statement on your UCAS application form, that you can't add additional ones, which is why if you can be focused with your course choices, that's better because you don't have an opportunity to submit a second one. Fab. Yeah, so in, in terms of if people are applying, as, as you mentioned at the start, all for this one university, would you um, recommend talking about the university in the personal statement if they're if there's no other application universities or is it best to still keep it general for things like you say, like clearing? I'd keep it general. Um, the prob it's not a problem. When you apply to, to university through UCAS, it's what we call like a blind application. So if you mm -hmm. apply to Nottingham Trent, we can't see where your other four choices potentially are. If in your personal statement you name drop or reference your first choice of university over and over again, you run the risk of annoying your other four choices. So try and keep it general um, where possible. We do recognise that in a lot of cases, students will do activities or taste the days with a university that's quite local to them. So if you lived in Nottingham, you might have been to Nottingham Trent on a taster event. That's yeah. absolutely fine. That's a kind of introducing you to university type activity. But again, you don't have to name drop the university. So you could say I attended a taster day at my local university to learn yeah. more about law, for example. So again, you don't have to name drop it. I'd try and keep it general if possible. It just means that your personal statement has got that broader appeal um, should you need to use it clearly. Yeah, definitely. I think this is the last question, I believe. So if you hand in your personal statement in January before the deadline, do you have less of a chance than people who have applied before that? Nope. And um, so it's a fair admissions process. So um, you have an application window. And as long as you or applications received within that window of time, then you stand the exact same chance as somebody who submitted it right at the start of the application window. If your application is late reaching your university choices, so let's say it doesn't get submitted until February, in the vast majority of cases, we will still look at it, but there's no guarantee that you then stand the same chance. And obviously, if a course is full at that point, it is full. But no, as long as you are, your application has been received within that deadline window, it's absolutely fine. Brilliant. And that brings us to the end of our live event. So mm -hmm. thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We do actually have a series of live events. If you head to ntu.ac.uk forward slash applying, the banner was just at the bo bottom and it's popped away. It might come back in a minute. Um, you can find all our future live events. We've got them running right up to the UCAS deadline at the end of January. And next week is our parents live event. So any questions we have our parents have about the application process, um, Kirsty will be here to answer those questions next week. I believe it's at 6.30, but again, you can find out all the information on the 
a little bit of anything that's going on across the screen now. So yeah, as I mentioned, if we haven't got through to your comments on the live, then just send us a direct message on social media and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions that way. And yeah, thank you very much, Kirsty, for being yeah. the being all the personal statement knowledge <laughs> this afternoon. Amazing. So thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you next time. See you later. Bye. Bye.